So while everybody's attention has been focused on Boca Chica, or when they do pay attention to Cape Canaveral, it's pretty much been about SLS, Artemis 1, and nothing else. Other things have been quietly happening out at the Cape, and happening very quickly. The first rocket being launched by a very promising emerging launch provider is getting ready for its maiden flight. And when it comes to relativity space, I must plead guilty. I have skipped over this launch provider again and again, even though many of my viewers have encouraged me to do a video about them, and I must extend my most sincere regrets and apologies that I have not made a video about this company, because the title is in no way clickbait. I believe that what this company has planned, and given the expert and also the colossal amount of funding that this company has behind it, I have every confidence that Relativity Space is going to prove to be a very potent competitor for not only Blue Origin, but SpaceX as well. This is based on the perceived performance or the expected performance of their first rocket, the Terran 1, but of course, more significantly, on the future performance of the Terran R. But really, both of these rockets have the potential to disrupt the entire damn market. And again, I don't think I'm overstating myself here. The cost per kilogram of the Terran 1 is very impressive, significantly better than any other small launch provider when we're talking about small sats, microsats, etc. But that's only the very beginning. The Terran R is going to have the potential to compete directly against every heavy launcher in the industry. Even though it is only technically a medium launcher, essentially on the level of the Falcon 9, it is so much more than that. And Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk are going to be in for the fight of their lives. But how did all of this happen? How did a company that was started by a couple of former Blue Origin employees who were not billionaires, not independently wealthy, manage to accumulate so much investment and have developed so quickly to where they are going to get to orbit substantially before Blue Origin does, even though their company has been in existence for less than half the time. Well, we're going to find all of that out in just a moment. Believe it or not, this company, founded in 2015 by Jordan Noon and Tim Ellis, both of whom, as I said before, were former Blue Origin employees, are now poised to go to orbit in such a short amount of time. How the hell did they do it? Well, for one thing, it's expertise. Both of these individuals are beyond geniuses when it comes to rocket science, rocket design, and innovative ways of producing rockets. And as you just saw in this little promotional video, they approached and won over celebrity investor Mark Cuban, and it's just been skyrocketing from there. This company has now raised just shy of $2 billion in capital and is now valued at well over $4 billion. It's insane, and they've managed to open offices across 
across the country. Their main headquarters is in Long Beach, California, 120,000 square feet. Their engineering office in Seattle, Washington. On top of that, they have something called Building 330, which is located at Vandenberg Air Force Base, which will give them access to a variety of different polar and sun synchronous orbits. Then, of course, they also have Launch Complex 16 at Cape Canaveral and also a test facility at Stennis Space Center. Actually, two of them and a full-fledged factory there as well. Essentially, everywhere that NASA has traditional facilities, they're located there as well. It's really impressive, and the technology and plans of this company are beyond ambitious. But here's the one thing that sets them apart, the way they build rockets. And they build rockets with something called Stargate. Stargate is the largest 3D metal printer on the planet, and as you can see, they have a whole bunch of them at their manufacturing facility. These guys believe in 3D printing everything. If you take humans out of the equation, the cost of building rockets drops radically. So they don't just 3D print the engines like some companies, they 3D print the whole damn thing. What this does is reduce the cost of the rocket, and also increase the speed and efficiency that rockets can be constructed. Their goal is to build rockets as ambitious as the Terran R in 60 days, allowing them to produce as many as six rockets per year. And no one explains this technology better than Tim Ellis himself. Quote, as a vertically integrated technology platform, we are at the forefront of an inevitable shift toward software-defined manufacturing. By fusing 3D printing, artificial intelligence, and autonomous robotics, we are pioneering the factory of the future. Disrupting 60 years of aerospace, we offer a radically simplified supply chain, building a rocket with 100 times fewer parts in less than 60 days. So the most impressive result of this technology is the Eon engine, and for a first engine, man, it's impressive. Very advanced technologically, and also pretty similar to its competitors over at Blue Origin and SpaceX. Each engine uses two turbo pump assemblies for thrust and mixture control ratios, one with liquid natural gas and one with liquid oxygen. The thrust chamber is then cooled with liquid natural gas and then injected into the main combustion chamber and burned with liquid oxygen to produce the required thrust. This sort of sophisticated staged combustion system is similar to how SpaceX and Blue Origin increase the performance of their engines. And even though these engines are only designed for a relatively small launch vehicle at present, their performance is still very impressive. We're talking 23,000 pounds worth of thrust at sea level, and they have nine of them, so that means you're looking at 207,000 pounds of thrust. Far, far more than Rocket Lab has, but let's stop talking about Rocket Lab for comparisons. Instead, we can talk about the Virgin Orbit Launcher 1, which has a total of 75,000 pounds worth of thrust. I'm sorry, 73,500. Nevertheless, that's being provided by a single engine, so that's impressive, but that's all it has to offer. So you're looking at nearly triple the performance of what Virgin Orbit has at its disposal disposal, and the payload shows it. Relativity Space advertises a payload of 1.25 metric tons to low Earth orbit, which is a tremendous amount of payload for a small launcher, and many experts think that it's actually going to be just shy of 1.5 metric tons, and it can get 900 kilograms up to sun-synchronous orbit. This blows away Virgin Orbit, Rocket Lab, just about everybody, with the possible exception of a 
couple of emerging launch providers in Germany, Rocket Factory Augsburg and Isar Aerospace. Interestingly enough, Isar Aerospace is also relying on a lot of 3D printing and advanced materials, and in addition to that, Rocket Factory Augsburg makes use of the same kind of staged combustion, liquid methane, and liquid oxygen propulsion. Very interesting to see these companies go head to head with each other. And if you want to learn more about European launch providers, here's a link that gives you a rundown on 10 of them. And by the way, also like Relativity Space, these two German launch providers intend to send up their first rocket in the next 12 months. But here's an important difference. Relativity Space has raised way more money than either of these launch providers. As a matter of fact, they've raised significantly more money than all 10 of the European launch providers that I describe in that video. Where the hell is a European Mark Cuban? Where the hell is somebody in Europe that's willing to invest large amounts of money in what's going to be a highly competitive and lucrative industry? Yes, I'm asking you Europeans to really start hassling the people with money in your various countries, but let's move on to what's coming next. Because really, this initial launcher, the Terran 1, is just a test bed for the technology, for the 3D printing, for the engines. The Terran 1 is nothing more than a precursor to this, the Terran R. And this rocket is what's going to take this company and the entire industry into a completely different dimension. Yes, it does the same thing that Starship does with a smaller payload, but nevertheless with many individual advantages, at least in theory, that's going to make it competitive with just about everything. It's capable of bringing, as you can see, 20 metric tons up to low Earth orbit. It also has a 5 meter fairing, which means it's capable of carrying up just about all the human rated vehicles that we have in process right now. Dream Chaser, Crew Dragon for that matter, Boeing Starliner, anything that anyone puts together that can carry human beings into space can be carried by this rocket. And at least in theory, this rocket will be substantially less expensive than either Falcon 9 or Falcon Heavy, or perhaps even Starship, depending on what the price point of that rocket ends up being. There are many advantages to the Terran R. It also doesn't require such a massive exclusive zone. As we have seen with Starship, a huge region of any land that a starbase gets planted on has to be made aware of the potential dangers of such a massive rocket. It produces lots of noise. It has the potential of producing a massive explosion if anything goes wrong. The Terran R is no more dangerous than a Falcon 9, except it's 100% reusable. Both the first stage and the extremely aerodynamic second stage. And given the price point that's being advertised for the Terran 1, the 3D printing system that Relativity Space has come up with can apparently deliver a launch cost that is just miles beyond what everybody else is capable of. Right now, the Terran 1 can launch for $12 million, which is roughly the same as what Virgin Orbit charges for a much smaller payload. Load. What might this rocket be capable of with all these 3D printed parts and increased simplicity and automation plus 100% reusability? All of these things give this rocket a particular advantage, once again, in theory. But wait a minute, wait a minute, you Starship hater, you. Starship can carry 100 tons up to orbit. I'm not taking anything away from that. Nobody can do what Starship can when it comes to its massive payload. But here's the question. How many customers are going to need 100 tons worth of payload, given the fact that Falcon Heavy hasn't been used since 2019? There may not be a whole lot of customers who really need more than 20 metric tons, which gives 
this rocket a particular cutting edge advantage over all the other launchers that fall within its category, that is to say, carrying up about 20 metric tons for the smallest amount of money. But SpaceX aside, let's not talk about them because I think they are going to be the most potent competitor for this company. Instead, what we should talk about is Blue Origin and New Glenn. They are going to be in a world of sh because what applies to Starship is definitely going to apply to New Glenn. Even though New Glenn has a theoretical payload capacity of more than double of the Terran R, how many customers are really going to need all that damn payload? And here's another important difference. Although Blue Origin has plans of making their second stage reusable or perhaps usable as a space tug or something else, it's not built into the initial design which means Terran R will be 100% reusable, New Glenn will not. How many customers is New Glenn really going to need that are going to require more than 20 metric tons and are willing to pay for it? Because I don't see any way that Blue Origin is going to be able to deliver the cost per kilogram that Terran R is going to be able to deliver given its reusability and its other advantages in terms of production and materials. And it doesn't stop there. On top of that, relativity space is also talking about introducing a space tug or space transport to be launched by the Terran R that will provide Earth to Moon transport to establish an Earth to Moon infrastructure. The same sort of thing that ULA has been talking about for a very long time, except Relativity Space might be able to do it for a lot less money. And yes, all of this is still theoretical. However, it's very much worth noting just how many different high-end customers Relativity Space has managed to accumulate thus far. The most significant of these is OneWeb, a company that desperately needs to get the rest of their constellation into orbit, but really doesn't want to keep doing business with a competitor like SpaceX. So guess what? They've secured services with OneWeb and the Terran R in 2025, a rocket that doesn't even have a prototype or a Pathfinder version ready. That's the kind of confidence that people have in this company, and I think it's confidence well spent. Well, I think as you've probably noticed, I have had to change to a backup microphone because of a failure in my audio system, so I am off to replace my microphone as much as I hate to have to go and do that. If you want to support my channel, this would be a lovely time to do it. Everything is in the description. There are a variety of different ways to keep this channel going and keep this content coming, and if you like this type of content, just a like and subscribe would be very much appreciated. So until Relativity Space really gets going, until this once humble startup that now openly talks about contributing to mankind's expansion to Mars and beyond actually breaks through and becomes a competitor worth contending with, I urge all of you to stay angry about space.